Hello, everyone. So if you haven't seen the pre-survey already, um, we'll go ahead and keep posting that in chat. That just helps me under know if the training went as well as we can. I'm going to continue running it as well, so it's helpful for me to know. Um, feel free to unmute at any time when you have questions. We have a small group, so we can pause for questions kind of in the moment. And I will pause regularly for questions too. Okay. Let me just get my screen a little more organized. And, um, and Karen, if you see anything pop up in chat that I need to address, thank you. That'd be helpful because my screen got very crowded very quickly <laughs> with all of the various windows. I'm sure most of you can commiserate since you're teaching in D2L, teach online. All right, so my goal is to empower you to use your course data to help your students succeed. That is the goal of today's training. So first today we'll talk about the possibilities of the data. You should understand the types of data and what they're for before we go and look for them in D2L. Second, you'll open a course and follow along to find the data. Please don't look for a course or open D2L until I prompt you to. We want to avoid rabbit holes until necessary, um, but I'll give you plenty of time to find each element in your course once we're there. And you may feel a little of what your students feel on Zoom today. <laughs> um, so I know it's very tempting to, to start there, but if you can accept the challenge of not entering D2L quite yet. Okay, so a little bit about me. I'm Kate. I'm the Senior Course Analyst in Learning Design here at St. Leo University. I work in academic and learning analytics in D2L, which is St. Leo's learning management system. My top three things are family, coffee, and data in that order. And fun fact, I learned, I earned my undergraduate degree in middle grades education here at St. Leo, and I'm originally from Pasco County. Actually, Dr. Sedlak, you were one of my university supervisors back in the day, so full circle. Um, Maybe it should be loading. Okay. Okay. So, um, learning analytics is defined as the measurement, collection, analysis, and reporting of data about learners and their context for purposes of understanding and optimizing learning and the environment in which it occurs. We love long definitions in education, but the second part of that definition is the pivotal piece. Why do we measure and analyze? to understand and improve learning. We have the data, but how can we use it to improve learning? Um, research suggests that instructor engagement in online courses has a great impact on students' sense of belonging. In fact, our um, assessment institutional research office has been doing, uh, has been conducting research as they always do, but confirming that it's true for our St. Leo students as well. So as a prior teacher myself, I know you're busy putting out fires and caring for your students and new tools with big promises are great, but they can often be time consuming. Uh, however, the data we're talking about today are already in your course. They're just a few clicks away. There's no new tools or logins to learn. I broke this material into two sessions, two weeks apart to make it digestible. I plan on following up with you to nudge you and to be there for questions. Um, also register for the second session if you haven't already. This content is being made into a CTL course for badging coming soon. So look out for that as well. And being here today shows how invested you are in your students. Please share this information with your peers and encourage them to register for the CTL or to contact me. For those of you who are not instructors, I appreciate you taking the time to learn about this. We definitely need an awareness campaign for the D12 data. Data can be overwhelming, but I'll show you how to utilize it in an easy and meaningful way. So we've got less than 60 minutes, so let's jump in. Okay. There's a little more information about the culturally engaging campus environments as well. Okay, it's part one, the questions your data can and can't answer. Remember, don't open D2L yet, it's a challenge, I know. So here are the five big things you can do. The first four are about consuming the data. And that last one is the actionable piece that goes with each of the four strategies. We'll get into the details with each strategy in order because I want you to understand what these data are for before we look for them in your class. 
have the first and highest level of data available to you as your class progress. This is probably the most familiar piece as it's the easiest to stumble upon. This is your main dashboard where check engine light or low tire alerts show up. Along with viewing the amount of content students have seen, you can also gain insight into their login habits, grades, and discussion participation. This page is a great way to get a quick overview to regularly check in with. I recommend checking this page at least weekly or whenever you access your course because red flags will pop up here that you can address quickly. You can click the cog to change the data view to what most applies to your class. I'll give you time to explore those settings shortly and we'll go through each of the different ones. From here, you can also click on a student to see their individual questions or individual details. Sorry. Do we have any questions so far? If not, that's okay. Just wanna pause in case. Okay, it's pretty early on still. So. Nothing okay. in the chat. Okay. Okay, next we have analyze engagement. So in an online classroom, we have proxies for things you'd experience in an on-ground class, such as time and content and discussions. In person, the time a student spends engaged with content or what their peer-to-peer -peer discussions are like are often invisible or at least ephemeral to the instructor. As soon as the students leave the classroom, that information is gone. But in an online class, you have the magic opportunity to see this information quantitatively. Seems insane not to do anything with it since we have it. And we know students succeed when they engage with content. And if they aren't engaging, intervening can help. So these two data points are for engagement, our time and content, and discussions. Time and content shows you both the class average and individual student time. Use class average to understand what content is skipped, engaged with, or possibly challenging if a lot of time is spent. Review individual students' time to dive deeper if a student is having trouble. Do they engage with the appropriate content? Also, some of our instructors have, I've heard have used this to support flipped classrooms. You can know if your students viewed your lecture or content before they arrived. With discussion data, you can easily see what discussions are hot topics and which could be bolstered with your additional influence. See which students are engaging the least or most and how that aligns with their course performance. Use this information to target communication with students. I do advise against using time and content for participation points or anything that can be seen as punitive and I'll explain why. But do we have any questions so far about this? Okay. So some details about time spent in content. This data is extremely valuable, but there are caveats you need to know before acting on it. Engagement analytics is evolving every day, and I want you to be aware of how the system works and not to assume that it's magic behind the scenes. But don't be so afraid of the caveats that you don't use the information at all. I share this with you so you can be confident in your actions. So my making a sandwich caveat. A student could be avidly consuming content in your class, or they could be making a sandwich in another room. Just because you see that they were on a screen for four minutes, doesn't mean their eyeballs were glued to the screen, or even if they were, that they were mentally present while their eyeballs were glued to the screen. Time and content is best used to encourage students and analyze trends, but not anything punitive. Because again, we don't really know what's going on there. Some more information here, the details. When we're in time and content, you'll see these question marks come up. And this is the window that pops up when you see these question marks. It's telling you some information about the time spent. The time tracker times out at an hour and a half. So if a student hasn't clicked to another screen before an hour and a half, then the clock starts over and it's counted as zero. When a student has multiple visits, like all of these three students, it's not really a concern because you still see the total time they spent on the content. It might just be an underestimate. And that doesn't really impact your decision making here. I just wanted you to be sure of what those question marks mean so that it doesn't dissuade you from using it. And it will tell you how many visits it timed out. And then it counted it for zero. A little bit about the Pulse app and how that works with this time tracked. So currently around 25% of our students are using the Pulse app to access their courses. 
not necessarily exclusively, but they are using it. The time students access content via the phone app, which is the Pulse app, is not tracked yet. However, the fact that they were on the screen in the app, the fact they were in the module, that was tracked. So it gives them like a tick mark, but it doesn't count how long they're there. And here's how you can tell. So I populated this here. If you see a one in the number of visits and then a bunch of zeros, that means it gave them a tick mark for visiting, but it didn't track any of the time they were there. We're just, the app isn't there yet. You can see multi, most of the time students have multiple visits. So it's rare to see this zero, 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 zero. But again, this is why I share these caveats with you to advise against using time and content for participation points or anything punitive. We can use this data to analyze trends or to start conversations with students, such as, I noticed you didn't engage with the content as much this week. This is a challenging concept and students who spent more time on it were more likely to do well in the midterm. So I recommend reviewing this week's content again. Kind of not being accusatory with this is going to be your best bet since there are a lot of caveats and a lot of things going on here that we just don't know yet. So now that we know what they're engaging with, how about the quality of that attention? And Cheryl, I know you had more questions about this. So I think when we get into D2L and we can see this whole screen, we'll be able to see that more. But did this, um, I know you were talking about the um, when a student visited. Yeah, sort of. Um... I guess I had another question related to this. If it says never visited, that's, I mean, that can be trusted, right? If it says never visited? If it shows never visited, that means they never visited it on with their login. Okay. Um, if a student is in a study group of some kind um, or something like that, yeah. you can probably assume that. They never- Talking about not being punitive, but if I say to a right. student, you never visited the module content. I, I think I know why you didn't do well in your quiz type of thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, and this helps, it, like I said, it was just more the timing of those number of visits, like what, when they happened during the week was right. Yeah. A, a deeper dive. I couldn't, I didn't know how to do so. Yeah. And I think from this screen, it does give you things mostly in aggregate, um, mm -hmm. definitely rolled up to that top level. Um, even from my end, like in the way background data that I see it, it'll show me the last time they visited. And I think the total number of visits, I don't know that it tracks that it keeps every single row of those data. Um, this is a massive data set. It's like 5 million rows or something like that. And it just keeps building and building and building in the background. It's huge. So I think that must be probably a, a data saving thing that they do that. But we can look more and I can ask questions about that too, the two well people. Okay, so how about the quality of the attention that they're spending while they're there? So, so far we've looked at getting an overview of their class progress and analyzing engagement. We still have a couple more ahead of us. So next we're gonna look at monitoring the grasp of content. We have three ways to check this out. We have quizzes, rubrics, and grades. You're likely familiar with most of them, if not all of them. So quizzes can show you what questions students are missing. Do the challenging questions have something in common like the concept or section number? Is it a gap in vocabulary? And encouraging students to look at their own results. I'll have more on quizzes too in the next section as well. So for rubrics, what criteria are students struggling with? Is it such an understanding level, a synthesis level, or extremely likely a formatting level of APA formatting or MLA formatting? Rubrics allow you to dive into that data a little bit deeper to see where students are struggling so you can target your communication with them. And then for grades, if an assignment is granular enough or a single concept assignment or quiz, you can use this grade statistics page to determine where students struggle. However, most of your assignments are likely going to be larger, multi-concept like midterm or, or something like that. It's gonna involve multiple steps and concepts. So this page wouldn't really be useful to figure out where students are struggling 
but you can use this to compare with engagement to find patterns. Students who spent this amount of time here did this, performed this way on these bigger assignments. Okay, do we have any questions at this point? I'll pause for a moment. Okay. I, I have one. Are, are you able to figure out if there's a question itself that's not working? Yeah, that's like a, a question that is um, challenging or possibly written incorrectly? Yes, both. Yes. Or either. <laughs> yes, when we okay. get, um, yes, you definitely can do that. Um, and I'll show you a little bit more about that shortly. So these are our three ways we can check monitor graphs of content. And the bulk of our time here is gonna be actually in detail looking at those different things with your, with your data, with your uh, student information. So you now know, based on looking at these, what concepts, words, or skills students are struggling with. You don't have to wait to address it. This all makes for fantastic conversation in live sessions, announcements, one-on-one -on -one correspondence with students, and even to help you prepare for the next term. You can tell students in advance what content was struggling, what content was challenging, sorry, in the previous term. If you find something off that should be addressed, like a typo in a quiz or the wrong answer marked correct, please use the request help with course link in your instructor resources module. So that's the module that students can't see. There's a button that says that, that directly contacts our UX team and learning design. However, if you notice any issue with any material, you would contact your chair um, or like full-time faculty and they would help you out with that part. Okay. Hey, you mentioned, yeah. a, you mentioned a few moments back about granular enough. Can you kind of elaborate on that a little bit more? Yeah, so um, let me go back to talking about that. So here. So when we look at the grade statistics, Oftentimes our assignments are, are asking students to do multiple things at the same time. If it's them writing a paper, that involves generally them reading sources, synthesizing sources, being able to compose sentences correctly, formatting. Those are a lot of different skills and concepts that they need to get to this final grade. So when you're looking at this grade distribution overall, you see that students are struggling from this page by itself, you don't know exactly what they're struggling with. Which area, which of those things was it like literally reading? Was it complex vocabulary? Was it a concept they didn't understand? Um, there's all of those things. If you have single concept assignments, so I think of these as generally they're formative assignments. It might be on a single section of a chapter or um, possibly a vocabulary quiz, um, or if you do any targeted grading where you ignore like writing formatting and you only grade based on their understanding of the concept, then you can use the grade to determine what you can help them with. So what can I post an announcement with based on this? Like, here, the students did really well in the midterm, but if say it was the opposite, you couldn't say, hey, you need to work on your vocabulary, everybody, because we don't have that information here. Does that help? If it doesn't, just let me know and I can, <laughs> I can frame it in a different way. Monique, hi, I see your, your hands raised. Yes, um, so if you're creating what I try to make sure that I do when I'm working with faculty, is when they have their practice activities. Um, I've done that in certain places where we're checking like AP style, for example. We'll create a practice activity or a quiz inside of D2L just to measure certain like capitalization, for example. We wanna know if they understand that or um, how to format certain information in that style of writing. And then we put that in, but we, we grade it not, it's formative, but we grade it as a practice assignment in a big bucket so that they get a grade for it. It's not punitive because there's a whole lot of other practice things that go in that bucket. So if they don't do well on it, it's not really gonna affect their grade, but them doing it you know, brings their grade up, if that makes sense. It might be like 20% of their final grade to do all the practice assignments. And then that builds them towards something else. So we could look at that data granularly 
um, even though it's a practice, it's set up as a quiz or something like that in there. And then we could use that data to inform during the live session or whatever before they go on to the next concept, the next module. Would that work in that way? Yeah, exactly, okay. exactly. That's definitely like those formative assignments are either gonna be ungraded or like you said, they're gonna be in a bucket with a lot of other homework type things. So it's not gonna impact them. So if it's a targeted writing assignment like that, where you're just looking at capitalization, you can totally use the grade distribution to figure out if they pass, if everybody is good with it or if you need to do some remediation. Um, otherwise, the if it's a set up as a quiz, I would always go into the quiz area um, to look at the data there. Or if you have a rubric, always go there. So the grades data, um, I know it's typically what we first think of when we think of data. So that's why I try to get really into what the grades data is good for, because we do have the quiz and the rubrics, which generally most of the assignments are gonna be evaluated with one of those two. Um, but that's a great point, um, Monique. I appreciate your, your designer's perspective on that as well. <laughs> that's definitely helpful. Okay, I'll go up to... Okay, so identifying misconceptions and um, Professor Didez, this was what you were asking about. So how do we find out what students are choosing in their answers? What are they thinking? So looking more granularly at quizzes illuminates their misconceptions. The small blue arrows, I realize they're super tiny on your screen right now, but when you're in your D2L shell, they'll be bigger. So they're right here next to the, next to the correct answers. Those will show you the correct answers. So you can see if students are falling for distractors or if they are totally confused. So um, in this question, it looks like there were two correct answers. Most students were picking those, but we did have one student that was confused that picked a different one. So being the subject matter expert in your class, you could determine, is that a distractor question? Is that a vocabulary issue? What's going on there? And when we go into your course, you can look at, if you have quizzes, you can look at those results and see right where that is. And you can address that as quickly as, as you want to. Okay. And our last thing, as I've been saying for each strategy is to use this information specifically to target reteaching both to your whole class or to individual students. Intelligent agents are great to um, automate these communications. And we'll talk more about that in session two because that's kind of an advanced use. But for now, the simplest thing you can do is to use the strategies we already talked about and just tell your students what you see. A good way to start with, I noticed that dot, dot, dot. You fill in the blanks there. Students' perception that you're engaged with them is invaluable. These data help make your efforts more impactful so that you can focus on what matters at the moment when you're communicating with them. You can have that data right in your hands. To review our five strategies, and then we're going to go into D2L. You can get an overview of your class progress, analyze engagement through time and content and discussions, monitor students' grasp of content through quizzes, rubrics, and grades, identify misconceptions through quiz statistics, and finally use this information in communications with students and to inform your instruction. Part two, where to find your data. So go ahead and make your way to D2L and choose a course that you're teaching now or at least one that has data. And um, learning designers, I put you guys in a class. I think I messaged you about that. So you can go into that class and I will be showing along um, on my screen, but it really helps if you're in a class that has some data in it because Mine will be my, my sandbox course. And this will be recorded and there will be a, um, a tutorial available later. If you do start going down a rabbit hole with something, um, make a note or take a screenshot of it and come back to it later. I know it's really, it's hard to let go of the rabbit holes. <laughs> well, I have a question. How do we get to D2L if you're on the screen? I can't minimize it. So if you click on the screen, like click on Zoom and then hit escape, you should be able to, um, to minimize your screen, the viewing window. Okay, then you're saying go into D2L? Yes. 
I will go into D2, uh, D2L as well. Okay. All right, once you kind of find one that works for you, we're gonna start with course progress. So I'll just hold my cursor over where, how you get there and then meet me at course progress. Do we go into the sandbox? Um, no, pick, a, choose a course that you have, um, that's either running now that you're teaching or possibly one from last term that has, uh, you've had some students, you've had grades, some discussions. I'm just using my sandbox for the purposes of the, the tutorial. Okay, to get to class progress, you click the progress and then class progress. And you'll see a screen that looks like this, only hopefully you'll have a longer list of students than my one example student. Monique? Should there be students in the course you assigned us? Yes. So there's no students in this one. Okay. So let me... All right. Um, if you're having trouble finding a course or you don't know which one to use, you can still also just follow along with me on here as well. Are we good to move on or just, do people need more time? If you need more time, just let me know. Okay. So on the class progress screen, you'll see a list of your students and you'll see four dashboard items or four indicators. Yours are probably going to be different than mine. And actually, let me zoom in. Zoom in. Make it a little easier for you. Your four indicators are probably gonna be different than mine because I've adjusted mine to be these, okay? So here is that kind of uh, dashboard indicator, red flag, check engine light. And this is where we wanna be checking weekly or every time you go into the course because you can see top level what's going on. If there's anything you, you need to address right away. Okay. You can use settings, the cog, okay, to choose which items you wanna see, which indicators you would like to see, okay. And I'll cancel out of this and go back to show you where that cog was because I click that kind of quickly. So the settings cog here next to help on the class progress page, that's gonna change our four items that we see here. So if you have um, like checklists here, most of us don't use checklists, so we can get rid of that and choose something else. Okay, so on our settings, I'll go through what each of these are. Okay. Content visited summary. This is the first one I have here. I recommend it. It's a good one to have. This shows you how many content topics each student has accessed by navigating within the content tool. If students are getting to the content outside of the content tool, such as using the nav bar at the top, it will not count it as a visit. Again, this is why I recommend not making any of this punitive because they can get into things multiple ways. So I recommend using this more as a relative indicator. You'll have all of your students in that list so you can compare and see where students are at. It can be a red flag for you. This student isn't engaging in, as much in the class. I should probably nudge them here. Monique? 
Um, so are these indicators automatically selected or do we have to set these up somewhere to get this report? Because I'm not seeing the same ones that you have, like the discussion participation summary or grade. Right, so when you click on the, the down arrow, you're gonna see the replace button. Okay. So when you hit replace, I'll do that now, it brings up the other options that you have. So you've got okay. the options that are selected for you and then more options. So you'll see a list there, which I'll go through in a second. The content visited summary, I recommend having there as a relative measure. Keep in mind, it's not 75% of where they should be in week seven. It's 75% of the total course. And this 120 includes all of the content in the course, whether it's required or not, and whether it's hidden or not. So that also includes like the instructor module. So that's why I recommend using it as relative because that bar is going to be, you know, for the, for your students, you'll have your students who are visiting a lot and your students who are visiting a little. You can kind of gauge with those numbers instead of the denominator here. Discussions participation summary is like it sounds. This is how your students are doing with their discussions, how many they're reading, how many they're creating, and how many they're replying to. If your course doesn't use a lot of discussions, replace it with something else, a different indicator. Grades performance, this is their most recent 15 grades in the class. When you hover over, it'll tell you what it is, what the assignment is and the score, okay? And then system access. There are alternates for these that I'll also talk about in a second. System access includes their logins from any source. So if they're logging in on a browser on their computer or using the app, the other option that says logins ignores the app. So I prefer to have system access on mine so I can see how students are getting there regardless, or I can see that students are getting there regardless of how. I don't care if they're accessing it on their phone or their computer. I just wanna know that they're in the class. Can I ask for cl uh, clarification? Yes. So system access is, specifically the course not d2l in general the opposite it's d2l not the course got it okay so that's how system access is different from course access yes when you're uh, on the okay. um when you click on the student and it has yeah. course access right. that's specific for the course okay and so login history is logging course login or system login it's system login, it's D2L login as well, but it, that one ignores the app. So that's only if they access via like a browser. Okay, Thank I'll you. go and I'll talk about that one again. So this one here, login history. This one shows the number of logins to the system, to D2L, only by the browser, not if they access it from the app. So if you don't want to include student, like if you want to ignore if they access from the app, you would have that. But I think for most of us, we just want them in the content. If they're getting it by carrier pigeon, that's fine. However, however they're accessing it. Other options you have are checklist completion. I think most of us probably don't use that. So you can ignore that. Content completion. So this is very similar to that content visited, but this is content completion. Most of our courses are set up where they have to click that they completed the content. This is an option for you. I just prefer having content visited because it's more, more holistic, includes more things. The content completion requires the student to click that, they might not, um, but again, that's up to you, just different options. You can also change up what these things are at any time. If you decide you don't like one, you can change it, run it for a term, see how you like it. Dropbox performance involves any assignment that has been submitted, whether it's graded or not graded. So if you have some ungraded assignments you wanna see their performance on, choose that one. Login history we talked about. Objectives completion, most of us don't use objectives in this way through D2L. Um, so that's probably not gonna be very useful for you. And again, you would just click it and it'll replace the one that you clicked the carrot on. Predicted grade, I haven't played around with this one too much, but I know it's using a D2L algorithm to figure this out. I recommend 
putting it in there for a term and seeing how it compares with what actually happens and seeing what kind of information you get there. Since it's new to you, I wouldn't recommend using it too much in conversations with students until you get used to what that means. Quiz performance is the same as the grades one. It just filters out to only quizzes. And survey completion summary, we don't use a lot of those um, in, in our D2L instance. So I wouldn't click that unless you know for sure you use surveys. So that's why I have these, these four picked for myself. Content visited, discussions, grades, and you can change the order, move up or move down, depending on where you want them to be. So yes. Yeah, oh, sorry. I had, this might be a strange question. So, um, so folks can, you know, faculty can customize, you know, what they are looking at here in terms of class project uh, progress, right? So, as chair, I can go into someone's D2L and I can kind of look around. Um, let's say someone's customized their class pro progress such that, like, course access is not in the list, but I want to see course access because I may be following up on a grade complaint or something. And I want to see, you know, when the student has actually accessed the course. Can I still find course access as the chair if the faculty person has not had that be part of their kind of dashboard or whatever? Yep, yeah, this is just so I'm going to save and close here. Okay. So you save and close when you've picked yours. So this is for your overview dashboard screen where you see everybody all at once. But if you click on the individual, oh, the individuals, okay. it still will show all of that. All right, thank you. Yeah, no problem. So when we click on a student back on your class progress page, you might have a bunch of stuff here that you don't use. You probably you do, you have a bunch of stuff here that you don't use. If you go to settings again, you can get rid of the stuff you don't need. I did that earlier. So again, settings go to the cog and I unclicked, I unchecked a bunch of these here that we don't use. Checklist, login, login history I unchecked because I want system access. It still shows me course access though. So that, that's where that would be here. And then I got rid of those other ones. You have some additional options here. And I also, I just found this today, which was really great. You can change how it brings up those colors. So if you're a grad class and you need different metrics here, if it's not 70% of above that's on track, if it's 85% and above, you can change these colors here. And all it does is change the colors. It doesn't change you know, anything for the students or anything in their final grades, just what's gonna jump out at you for colors that you need to see. Hey, let me see if I can get that and color coordinate mine. Uh, can you go back a step? I'm, going, I'm in my class. Yes, so for the, the dashboard for this. I'll go back to settings and. Yeah, if you want to pick which ones you're using, you go to settings and then on the arrow, you click replace or move up, move down. I didn't really put mine in any particular order. I just selected these four. Okay. And here you can hover, it gives you some different information on some of them if you hover as well. There's also this use agents to automate feedback, which we'll be talking about in session two, but there is a button there for that. Okay. So I'm gonna move on to time and content. If you do have any other questions about this too, if I'm moving, uh, you know, I move past something that you wanna talk more about, you can message me or email me as well. So time and content, to get there, we're gonna click on content and go to where all your modules are. We go to content and then we're here. If you remember from the pre-survey, there was a question about how do you find data in your courses? And it said, do you look for the word data, the word statistics, a drop down menu? Mm -hmm. So the word data isn't really anywhere in here. They use multiple ways to describe it, but I haven't really found the word data. So we do have, look for the word statistics and drop down menus. Exploring drop down menus is how you find a lot of the hidden gems here. 
So when you're on, in table of contents, you have to be clicked on table of contents, not one of your modules, not course schedule or anything like that. When you're here, you go over to related tools. You probably have some, you might have some different ones here, but view reports is the golden ticket. That's where you wanna go. So you're on table of contents, view reports. Give everybody a second to get there. Okay. Yeah, Monique. I think I missed a step because I don't see any of those things need. on table of contents. So I think I missed a step somewhere. Okay, you're clicked on table of contents? Uh-huh. Do you see related tools? No. I don't need it. And who else does that? Sorry. Let's see. I just see download. And Kate, that might be because people with their roles haven't been set up to view reports and see data. Okay, so that's Monique. And who was the other person that can't? Deborah. I don't see, yeah, I don't see that. And I'm in, I'm in content. Table of content. Okay, content, okay. table of contents, view reports. So Monique, it makes sense to me why you don't, because you're probably in there. You're in there as read only. So that makes sense that that must not be there for read only. Okay, so when we're designing courses and looking for the data, we're not able to see any of that. We just have to get that from the faculty member before our meeting. Well, that's so no, good. that's just something I didn't, I just didn't know that. Oh, so, okay. No, I wasn't sure, I've never done this before, even though I've, I've never looked this far in before. I used to just get it from faculty, but this any, is very really yeah. valuable, so. Can anyone else see it? I don't, I don't see view. view yeah, real quick, before I go into this, anybody who's an instructor, can you see view reports here? Because if you can't see it, then I'm going to skip through this. I can see it. Okay. All right, so I will show you this just in case. And for Deborah, I'll check it. Or Karen, Looney, if you don't mind um, seeing what um, why Deborah can't see it. So Monique, it makes sense because she's in read only um, in the course and she's a designer. Um, but if, Deborah, if you want to just follow along for now, and we'll we'll see how to get you that. Because if you're an instructor, it should be there for you. Okay. Here's where you can see how much time your students are spending on the content, okay? So you'll, you'll have two tabs, you'll have content and you'll have users. Under content, it'll show you your list of modules, how many students it's available to, how many visited and the average time they have spent on this content. So while you're here, see you know, which is the content that students are spending the most time on. See if that maybe is, is surprising or if it makes sense. Again, this is the average time spent using everything we know. So I know this page can be pretty interesting. So I'll give you a second here. This is kind of fun to see who has logged in um, in the last half hour to, to look at the PowerPoint that I just uploaded. <laughs> Good for you. Like, I'm proud of these three people. <laughs> yeah, and this is that page too where um, instructors have used it for flipped classrooms. Yeah. So to see how many students reviewed the content before they have lectures about it, to see how they wanna kind of tailor their, their conversation. So when you click on users visited as well, that's where you're gonna see the list of students for that content. So this module name is insights and I've got one student and they haven't visited it, but you'll see when they last visited the number of visits. Oh, that sorts it. So if you click the arrow, it'll sort by last visited. The number of visited, number of visits, sorry, total time and average time they have spent here. You can also email students directly from this page. So if you see something you need to address, you don't have to go anywhere else, it's right there. And here is where you'll have those question marks of the screen timed out, or here's where you would see this was a Pulse app visit. Mine only has two columns, uh, content topics available and content topics visited. My How do you add the columns you have? Okay, so content topics available and content topics visited. So did you go to 
content and then reports. Because there are multiple ways of getting to data in here. So yes. I don't know if that's a role based thing or if that's just multiple ways. Yeah, I went content, reports, and then users. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when you click on users, that's going to give you this screen. This is what you're seeing content topics available and content topics visited. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you go back to content and then click on like the number here under users visited, mm. I, I agree. It's <laughs> that, shouldn't, that shouldn't happen where you can do that. That's a. So if you click on that number, you should have all of the rest of the co uh, columns. Mm, got it. What number? <laughs> You're fine. On the list of your where it has all your modules, right. so you got content, your list, either available to or users visited. Those are hyperlinks, the little numbers there. Okay. Wow. Does that help? I think so. But it's just going to show it for the one module, or is this now the combination so of all? Would, that would be the one that one module that you decided to to select there. Okay. It'll show the yeah their information for that individual topic. If you want to look at that everything for that student, you would go to to users. Okay. Also, one other question on that. Yeah. One sheet where it has the two columns or slide content topics available, content topics visited. Right. Is the content content topics available based on the entire term or it being week five? That's based on everything in the course. Okay, so it, it's content topics available is 45 and it says 30, then that makes sense. They're not behind and they haven't been doing stuff. Right. Yeah. All right. Good. Okay. Yeah, that's a good way to look at it. And um, also that can show you if some students have more content topics available than others, then that would tell you that something's hidden um, for some students that maybe shouldn't be. It most likely won't be different between students, but you might have a whole module hidden, um, but that would be probably for your whole class. Um, so that's one reason why it says how many are available to them. So you can check that out. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Um, all right, next we're gonna move to discussions. So you get to discussions the same way you would, but activities and then discussions. Everybody can meet me at discussions. So again, we're gonna look for either the word statistics or drop down arrows. For this one, we're gonna click on the word statistics. So we're all getting in the same way. So at the top, under discussion statistics is all the way to the right. You can get this by going into the individual discussions as well. But for now, we'll get here, discussions, statistics. And you'll see this screen. Here you also have two tabs, users, and then forums and topics. For users, it'll give you the same discussion information that that main dashboard gives you of how many they've created, replied, and read, um, or except for it adds how many have been scored and, and unapproved. When you then click on forums and topics, which is the second tab at the top, you'll see a list of all of your discussions. And here you can compare overall, which are the most engaging discussions and which could use some additional influence. So students are going to largely re respond to the discussions they're required to. They're gonna read one and they're gonna to reply to two or whatever the requirements are. So we're probably not gonna to see too, many, too much variation there. However, you'll probably notice that the introduce yourself module is the most popular. And those around midterms and tests or towards the end of the term are gonna be probably less popular. You might see something different in your class, 
But I know from looking at all of the D2L data, kind of rolled up, introduce yourself as often one of the most engaged with things in the class which we can use that knowledge, right? People love talking about themselves and talking about each other. They love reading about each other. That's just human nature in general. And we can use that in our classes, right? How can you apply this to your life, to your situation? How have you used this? You can use what's engaging to keep them engaged. You can also, if towards the end of the term, students are dropping off, you can use this as another me measurement of that. So you know what's going on there. Monique? There's a feature to rate discussions in D2L for students. What would the purpose of what is the purpose of that and where does that get reported? So the, the rating them is would show up here. Post ratings up, down, and start. I haven't really heard of too many people using that, but if you do, that data would come up here. So if you see anything interesting you want to follow up on, go ahead and take a note of where you are or take a screenshot. Um, if you're not sure how to take a screenshot on my keyboard, it's Windows Shift S or the snipping tool. Depends on what kind of computer you're on though. Okay, because I know we're running out of time, I'm going to show you where the other ones are before we totally run out. So quizzes, you're going to get to quizzes the same way you normally would, activities and quizzes. If your computer is kind of running slow or something, you might just want to follow along with me at this point. So we've got statistics across the top. Also, if you go next to the quiz name, you'll see statistics. You can click either of those buttons. I have one quiz in here, so I have one that shows up here. It's got my average here. Gives you that information pretty much everywhere. First, it brings up user statistics. This just, again, gives you the, the grades. This, this you can get to in a bunch of different places. Question statistics. This is going to give you a distribution of the questions are plotted on this graph, not the students. So you've got your questions. Yours might say random question one. If you want to know what the text is, you just click on question one and it pulls up that question. Here you can see how students are doing on this, which questions were hard, which ones weren't. These statistics over here on the right are only available if you um, do not use a question pool or if they are multiple. So they have to be multiple choice questions and they can't be in a question pool. If you have any kind of homegrown quizzes like that or anything or some that aren't in a question pool, these are fantastic statistics. It just cannot compute them if students are getting randomized questions. If you have them, this, what do the statistics on this page mean? That button is explains everything you need to know for it. And it gives you great psychometrics for these questions, um, really helps to pick out the good questions and the ones that could be rewarded. Question details. This is the one that we were talking about earlier with the blue arrows, question details. Here it gives you the list of questions, what the correct answer is, has the blue arrow and what students chose. So here you can see if students are falling for distractors, if they're totally confused, or if the wrong item is marked correct, in which case go to the request help of course and instructor module. And you can let us know as soon as you notice that something's up. These statistics here again are there. Any questions about the quiz page? Okay, if you find a question though, just let me know at another time, I'm gonna to move to rubrics. You might not go to rubrics all the time. So that's under progress. And then rubrics, it's right under grades. Okay. Here it'll give you a list of rubrics. I don't see statistics at the top. So I'm gonna try looking next to the rubric itself. I've got the down arrow and I see view statistics right here. Oh no, it shows no activities. It'll show that for everyone. Don't freak out. Get, I've had multiple people freak out. They're not using the rubric. We just don't use this, this feature here. Competency activities is where you wanna go. So it'll show you a list of all of the assignments that this rubric is linked to. Mine is only linked to one, so it just brings up that one. But if you use it in the beginning of the term and the end of the term, you can see overall the difference in, in performance on that rubric. 
randomly, this is the only place I've seen that gives us a little bar graph to signify data. So I guess I should have included that too as another place you look for data is a tiny bar graph. Tiny bar graph shows us the general statistics overall, which is just gonna show where your students fell here, what percentage are at each level. Kind of helpful, not super helpful because it's an aggregate. Okay, this is the great part about rubrics right here. Mine just says criterion one because I just threw in a blank rubric. Yours would have what the criteria are. So yours might say, you know, application of concepts from the chapter or synthesis of sources, APA formatting. You're going to have those. Here you can see where students are falling along those levels. That's great. After you're done grading all your essays, you're like, oh, I know they were struggling with what one part. What was that part? Or you really have the feeling that they struggled with the synthesis part. And then you get here and you realize, oh, wow, no, most of my students were actually at a level three. That's great. That's where I want them to be. Um, and only a couple were at a level one, but that really made me think everybody was at a level one. And then individual statistics. I know we're really running out of time. You will see IT people in the individual statistics for rubrics. This is the only place I've found them that they show up. They're in everything because they're in IT. Um, so if you see their names here, they're just IT people, just in the background. <laughs> so they're in rubrics. Okay, last after that is grades. You know how to get to grades anyway, and it's just the little drop downs next to grades here. Um, Karen Garcia, can you post the, the post survey for me, please? Um, View statistics are here. Again, this is where you would go to see um, if it's a granular assignment or, or not, you would know that here. So you've got your grade distribution and it would show that here, your user statistics. I'm gonna tab back to my presentation and I understand if anybody needs to pop out, if you could please just answer the post survey, but I'm gonna go back to my presentation to finish up there, but I know we went right to the last second. We looked at where to find your data. We went in the course. Okay, so uh, we have the post survey and session two of this is on March 2nd. We'll do a deeper dive and extension. Anybody that asked questions, if I didn't answer them, I will have answers for you at that session. We'll talk about intelligent agents specifically for reporting to give you information, um, how to aggregate data across all of your sections and more use cases. That'll be at our second session in two weeks. Um, and please fill out the post survey if you haven't. Ready. If anybody has any question, I'm on Teams all the time. Thank you so much, Kate. We appreciate you and I appreciate your your um, expertise with this and look forward to your to your uh, your next session. Thanks. I look forward to it too. Always excited to share. And then the chat as well. Excellent job. Education and training shining through. Very helpful. Terrific presentation. You. And if anybody has any use cases of how you've used this, that's always really helpful for me as well when I'm showing with this. Um, like the one person who shared with me about using it as flipped classrooms, I share that as much as I can now. If there are no more questions, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. I have a quick question, Kate. Um, well, first of all, fabulous presentation. Just really, really helpful. Thank you so much. Um, but the the difference between the login status and this the system status or system statistics actually concerns me a little bit because I didn't I wasn't looking at system stats I was only looking at login and so when I compared the two of them when I brought them both up and I love the way you walked us through this and had us go into our own course and look at these things. Um, I had students who had substantially more logins than I realized because they were going in on their phones or tablets or whatever. And so 
in the future, I'm going to totally get rid of the login one because that doesn't seem very helpful when the system one is more accurate, correct? Is that, am I thinking about that right? Yeah. Yes. I don't, I just, so I asked about when I was going through this um, presentation and making sure I, you know, knew where everything was. Um, I asked our D2L tech manager, what's the difference between these two? And that's when he shared, this one includes everything. This one is just browser access. So I don't know who that's for. I mean, you know, D2L is K-12 and corporate and all that stuff too. So I don't know if that makes sense in another, you know, way. Um, yeah, yeah but that, I agree. Yeah, it was misleading to me and to thinking students were logging in less than they were. And in many cases, when I looked at this particular class, the students had logged in 30% more. When I looked at the two stats, the system login was much greater, almost 30% more. And for some students, it was almost the primary way. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, unfortunately, as you noted, we don't use this data uh, punitively but I thought it was giving me useful insight and it was misleading me really um, because I was looking at the wrong thing. So I really appreciate you showing us those and I'll definitely reset that on my future courses. Yeah, and definitely put the word out. Anybody that comes across <laughs> it, like this is you know, the one you wanna use um, for sure. And we're gonna keep having, I'm sure more and more students using the app to get to things, you know, I think the last numbers we saw the other day was like 2,500 students, I think using it um, recently, regularly. Um, so it's definitely, and you know, that could be some students that are using it all the time or for certain things. Um, they might not be submitting their assignments there, but they might be consuming the content, you know, when they have time in their commute, et cetera. And we do know, you know, a large part of our, our student body are non-traditional age students. They've got other stuff going on. They've got families, jobs, all that stuff, um, especially our online students. I think our current online student average age is like 35. Um, and I think we're over 60% female as well, based on my assessment institutional research friends. <laughs> But um, yeah, I agree. I found a couple things like that. I'm like, what is this? Crazy. And by the way, aggregating data across all sections, there's not a whole lot of magic there. It involves downloading CSVs and Excels. And <laughs> but just gonna kind of go through that. Um, unfortunately for instructors, you know, there isn't really a way to see all of your, your sections in that way. But if you're really interested and wanna, you know, do some research with it, that's how you would do that. Oh, I think uh, I think that could be really useful. In fact, that might be a future webinar: is how to use the course stats and the you know the analytics for your own research as a faculty member. So that yeah, that's a great. I think that's a great opportunity for faculty, especially as faculty are trying out new strategies and um, you know looking at aggregated data and being able to disaggregate it by semester to see how those you know compare and there could be some really awesome opportunities for faculty with that yeah pretty much anywhere in there you see export to excel or export to um, csv you can do that i'm not sure i'm gonna have to play around with what the variables are that downloads to see what you can join stuff on but very cool I can stay as long as as long as folks have questions. And yeah, I don't know why um, Deborah didn't have access to that. So we'll have to, she asked me to follow up with her. Very weird. Well, I've already made some changes. So 